Looking for some quick tips to improve your D&D &D game? Have you tried other DM tip videos and found them to be lacking? Do you wish there were a quick and easy way to run awesome games for your players? Great! Because in this video, we're going to do all of the above. Except for the be lacking part, I, I hope. And by the end of this video, you will be ready to kick some D&D butt. Hey, what is going on? Luke Hart here. Welcome to the fifth and perhaps final installment in my Dungeon Master Tips series. And if you're new to this channel, I create weekly D&D videos with information and resources to help Dungeon Masters run awesome games. So if that's something you think you might be interested in, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below and click the bell if you'd like to be notified when new videos come out. And today we are going to march through 10 more Dungeon Master Tips compiled by the fine folks over on Reddit. And if you wanna watch the entire series from part one, I will put a link up in the card here. Oh. And remember to stay to the end of the video for a special DM bonus tip. That's like a trick to get you to watch the whole, yeah, you got me. Anyway, number 41, plan what you don't want to improvise. Here are two guiding principles for you. Number one, you can't plan everything. Number two, you can't improvise everything. Or maybe I should say that you shouldn't improvise everything. There is a happy middle ground somewhere in between there, and it differs for each individual DM. My suggestion to you is that you plan things that you're not good at making up on the spot. For me, these are cool NPCs, or at least what I think are cool NPCs, and combat encounters. Those are the things that I do not want to have to improvise. So, I plan them. And then you wanna improvise the things that you are good at making up on the spot. Now for me personally, one of the things that's really easy for me to make up on the spot are detailed descriptions of dungeon rooms, like what's on tables and desks and stuff, closets and sh whatever. That stuff just comes really easily to me. And also I can make up silly voices or good voices or something for my NPCs pretty quickly. So I might plan out an NPC, character traits and flaws and background and stuff, whatever. But the voice, I usually just make that up on the spot. And number 42 is a strong corollary to the previous one, and that is learn how to improvise. I bet that came as a shock, didn't it? Now, I actually made an entire video about how I improvise, so if you want to check that out, there's a link up in the card somewhere here to it. However, that's just how I improvise. I imagine that there are probably lots of different techniques that you could use, so feel free to find something that works for you and then just go with it. I think the bottom line, though, is that you really need to practice improv if you're going to get any better at it. And the great news for you is that in the fine game of Dungeons and Dragons, you will have plenty of opportunities to improvise. Trust me. Number 43, be careful with lore. And what I really mean by be careful is that you perhaps don't want to get too heavy into all of the lore and background and backstory of your world when you're just starting your campaign, especially if you're homebrewing it. And I totally get that for many dungeon masters, homebrewing things and creating entire worlds is like a lot of the fun of Dungeons and Dragons. However, it can be frustrating sometimes if you create all of those things and then your players never get to see it or experience it because all they really want to do is hit things with sticks or swords or short swords or arrows or bows or fireballs or I think you understand. And the chances are that if you spent tons of time and effort making all of this lore and then they don't really care a whole lot about it, well, that, that could be kind of disheartening. And this could be especially true if you have mostly new players in your game, because from their point of view, you just took them and dropped them into the world's biggest sandbox and they can do anything they want. And the chances are those new players are not going to be particularly interested in political machinations or some sort of like subterfuge of a war and all of this stuff that took place like eight generations ago. So my recommendation is that you create only what you need for the immediate future. This will save you a lot of work and probably some frustration if it never gets used in the game. Of course, if you don't mind the possibility of that happening and you just wanna create that stuff because it's fun and cool, then yeah, go ahead and do it. And this is about where I'm gonna get somebody in the comments who's like, Luke, you just contradicted yourself. You said one thing, then you said another, ah, whatever. So you could leave a comment like that, or you could go down there and let me know about a time where you did create a bunch of lore or backstory or something, 
and it never saw the light of day. Number 44, remind the party that they are a team. It's okay for them to disagree about stuff, but at the end of the day, they are working together. It will save you a lot of time and effort if all of the players and their PCs work together and stay together in the game. Unless you think that it will be fun to run a handful of D&D games simultaneously because your players don't want to stay together. But hey, you're the DM, so that's your call. All right, number five is extremely important. Remove players from the game when needed. Do not be afraid to get rid of a bad player. If he's causing problems and you've taken him aside and you've talked to him and he continues to do the exact same things and it's causing a problem for your entire game, it is time to boot him before he destroys the game for everybody. So you do what you need to do, but at the end of the day, put on your big boy pants and do what's necessary to make sure that your entire game doesn't implode and one bad player drives away all of your good players. Because if that happens, that means that you just lost all of your good players and you got your bad player left. That's not a position you want to find yourself in. That, that would suck. By the way, if you're looking for free D&D adventures that you can run at your games, I have a handful of them over at my site, thedmlayer.com. There is a link down in the description to that. Feel free to help yourselves. Now, they are all adventures that I created and I ran at my own games, and they're not super, super polished, but they are free. Number 46, create situations, not stories. Now, what do I mean by this exactly? Don't create adventures where there are only one or two correct ways to actually win that adventure. Instead, plan that adventure as a situation that can be overcome by a wide variety of means. Now, many of the ways your players might come up with to overcome a situation you probably would never even consider. And when they do, you play through them. And if they work, they work. Example, let's say that there is an enemy stronghold. It's like a wooden palisade type structure, right? Moat and Bailey think. There are, they have to overcome these enemies, they have to defeat these enemies. How could they go about doing it? Well, off the top of my head, they could burn the place down, drive the enemies out. They could sneak in by night, going from room to room, killing them, trying to keep the noise down so the entire compound doesn't wake up. They could, what else could they do? Yeah, I, I don't know, they, they, there's probably lots of different things that they could do. The point is, as a DM, that I don't need to think through all of the possible routes. I put the situation there, they come up with something they're going to try, and then we play it out at the table and see what happens. The bottom line is that it's your player's job to solve the problems, not yours. Number 47, be flexible. Look, the players outnumber you, and they will almost always come up with plans and ideas that you could not anticipate. If you plan your game out so that the players go from point A to B to C, then you're probably going to be frustrated. Have an idea of what happens at A, B, and C. And then if they decide to go to B first and then A, and then skip C altogether, well, you have a general idea of what may happen. And honestly, this ties into our previous point about designing situations and not deciding ahead of time what the correct way to do something is. I mean, a quick little hack that could be helpful is to plan several encounters that could happen kind of anywhere, and then you kind of pull them out as you need them. However, what really helps for me is just simply being prepared and planning and having a really good idea of the world that I'm running the game in, and especially the city and the immediate location where the PCs are. And this makes it so much easier to improvise things when the need arises. And number 48, reward your player's interaction with the world. If your players engage with something, even if it's something very minor, then give them a reward. Make there be some sort of payoff for doing so. Did they just spend like 15 minutes cataloging all of the flowers in a forest because you happen to mention lilacs in your description? Okay, whatever. Then just make like one of the flowers they find be a magical healing herb or something. Did they have a super long conversation with some random NPC in the town? Okay, fine, then like have that random NPC tell them about how he knew somebody when he was growing up that just turns out to be the big bad in the game. I think that sometimes as dungeon masters, we might get a little frustrated when players goof off in the game world. But if your players are goofing off and doing things, there's a good chance it's because they find your world interesting and they're exploring and poking at things. And you want your players to engage with your world, so reward them for doing so. Of course, if it turns into one big, huge goof-off session and they're not doing anything remotely resembling Dungeons & Dragons, then you might want to have a conversation with them. Number 49, 
plan and prepare for the status quo. It is extremely time consuming and wasteful to plan your game out with your player's actions in mind. For instance, I once knew a guy who told me that he was running a game where he literally had a flow chart of every possible player choice and action and it showed where the game would go based upon what they did. That's crazy because you do all of this work prepping all of that stuff, most of it never gets used. Now, I think that it's safe to assume that the players are going to oppose the big bad of your adventure. However, it's not safe to assume exactly how they're going to oppose him. So what I'm getting at here is don't create adventures or encounters or situations that presuppose a certain plan of action by your players. For instance, let's say you create an adventure, an encounter as part of that adventure, that only happens when your players are noticed trying to sneak up to an enemy compound. And then what happens when your players successfully avoid being noticed? You can either railroad them into that encounter, totally negating all of the effort they probably went to and their good rolls and their stealth checks trying to sneak by, or you can throw away that entire encounter that you may have spent an hour planning all presupposed on the fact that they're going to get caught. Now, when you plan for the status quo, you create a, a situation and environment that is able to respond to whatever the players happen to do at any given moment. All right, let's go back to that compound example. It's heavily guarded and you create a specific number of patrol routes the quantity of guards in each patrol and what they do if they find intruders and you determine what those routes are. So if the players run into one of those patrols and they don't notice it, then you have an encounter that begins. However, on the other hand, let's say that your players notice the patrols and take some time to figure out the exact route that the enemy is taking. In that case, your players might decide to sneak past them successfully and after having noticed them and done some investigations, they could be successful. But once you have kind of prepped this compound and you know the patrol routes and you know what they do in reaction to intruders and you know what's in the compound and what's outside of the compound and you have a general idea of all of that stuff, it allows you to respond at the moment when your players do something that you may have never expected them to do. Number 50 describe all the senses. You know what I'm talking about. You have obviously what you see, you have what you hear, you have what you smell, you can have what you feel, you can have what you taste if your players go around licking dungeon walls and stuff like that. Anyway, whenever you're improvising a scene or describing a scene, you want to use at least a few of the different senses to describe it because this is going to make your world seem much more alive than only ever describing what they see. And now, for the bonus advice. Roll with your mistakes. Here's the deal, you are going to make mistakes at some point in your Dungeon Master career, and your players are going to notice. Maybe you have a vampire in your game, and you somehow managed to imply that your vampire is out in direct sunlight. And your players are like, hey, wait a second, that's a vampire. He can't be out in direct sunlight. And internally you're thinking, oh crap, I totally screwed that up. Externally to your players, you should say, yes, that's correct. Isn't that strange? Or just do what I do and don't say anything at all and just give them a totally blank look. That'll get them squirming internally. Because now your players think that you planned for that and they feel quite clever for having noticed and they're intrigued as to how it could be that a vampire is out in direct sunlight. And that buys you some time to figure out how in the world this could possibly work and then introduce some more story developments into your adventure. All right, and now at this point in the video, I would like to encourage you to check out some of these fine videos recommended by YouTube. Hey guys, thanks for watching, and until next time, let's play D&D.